Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Run now, I pray thee, meet her and say unto her, 
Is it well with me? <clears throat> Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. Oh, I love that. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, Paul writes to his son in the gospel, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. My God is still in the business of keeping things. Amen. <laughs> things that we put in His hands, God is still in the business of keeping things. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise and thank Him for the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, you may be seated. If you read previous to my verses, here in the text concerning this particular Shunammite woman, you'll find that the Bible said the prophet Elisha would come by her house and I suppose one day he smelled bread coming from the window. For the Bible said he turned in, probably asked her if perhaps she had something to eat. She made his introductions. You can read the Bible, you'll find that they became friends. And so it became a frequent thing that the man of God was stopped by. I will just simply inject this today that God is not something that you treat coolly or coldly and expect Him to continue just to keep knocking on your heart's door. But whosoever will, if they will invite Him in, He's going to show up. Amen. The Spirit of God, the presence of God, loves a hospitable spirit. I believe if anybody ought to be hospitable, it ought to be God's people. Praise the Lord as the body of Christ. But the Scripture said He turned in frequently there, and so it became such a frequent thing that finally one day this great woman. Now I believe the reason the Bible calls her a great woman is because that her house was on the wall of the city. You had to have some means, amen, to be able to have your house joined to the wall of the city. The Bible tells me that one day she spoke to her husband and said, inasmuch as you recognize this is a man of God, she said, why don't we build him a house or a, a room joined to our house here on the wall? And she said, let's build him a bedroom there. Let's put a bed in there. Let's put candlesticks in there. Let's put a desk and a chair. Let's just create a place where he can stop by from time to time, just drop in and, and rest. And uh, he'll stay longer than just for a short period of time if he's got a room. If we'll somehow create a place of hospitality, I just feel like it'll be more than just stopping by to eat bread. I think he'll stop by and stay a while. And sure enough, that was the case. <clears throat> The Bible said on a particular day that the man of God, Elisha, stopped by with his servant, Gehazi. He was looking at all that the woman had done for him, and he called his servant, Gehazi, and he said, Gehazi, he said, I wonder what could be done for this woman. And he called the woman to the door, and she came and stood at the door of this room that she had built for the prophet. And, and something struck me as to how important the ministry of this prophet was. I never really thought about it much until today. But he spoke to her and said, Would you like for me to speak to the king for you? Now that's, when you're rubbing shoulders with the king, you're not just a nobody. Right. So obviously this man was a man of influence. He said, Would you like for me to speak to the king? Or would you like for me to speak to the captain of the host? In other words, I'm also tied with the captain of the armies. He said, I can put a good word in there because somebody that's giving you trouble will just let me know. We can take care of that. Or if you need the king to hold out his scepter and give you favor of some kind, I'm tied with the king also. And uh, the scripture tells me that the woman said, no, I'm happy where I am and doing what I'm doing. I, I'm not interested. I don't need anything. But then the Hesa said, I happen to know a little bit about this lady. He said, her husband is old, and he said, she really has always wanted a child, but she doesn't have a child. It was then that the man of God spoke and he prophesied. 
And he said, according to the season of life, he said, thou shalt embrace a son. Notice how she responded. She said, oh no, don't, do not lie to me, thou man of God. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the last things I'd be telling a prophet was, don't lie. <laughs> yeah. If you're a prophet, you don't say a business lie. Amen. Don't lie. <laughs> Do not lie, she said to me. Amen. But notice what the Bible said. Amen. The Bible said that the prophet prophesied nonetheless. And he said this. He said, according to the season of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, don't lie to me. But you know what God said? Sometimes I'm going to do something in spite of the fact that you don't even believe it's going to happen. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. And that never really hit me but just a while ago when I got to think. I said, now that's some good stuff right there. <laughs> that's some good stuff right there. Amen. Sometimes God just so determines He's going to work in your world even if you don't believe He's going to work in your world. I love how God's grace works sometimes. I love how God just goes ahead and in some cases just pushes the door open and says, I'm coming in whether you like it or not. You need me more than you realize. Amen. I'm going to work in your world whether you realize it or not. Amen. She had absolutely no faith. Even to the point she said, I don't even believe you're telling the truth. I don't even believe you're telling the truth. Amen. The man of God said, regardless of whether you think I'm telling the truth or not, it is the truth. And God is going to bless you. And she said, I don't believe it's going to bless me. And he said, it's going to bless you anyhow. <laughs> my God, I'd love for the Lord to walk up on my porch here this morning. And start prophesying some stuff that my flesh don't even believe. But God knows I need it more than I realize I need it. Oh, hallelujah, my God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, there's things that God knows about us that we don't even know about ourselves. There's things that God can bring in our world that's going to bring such joy and such faith that right now our level of faith is not at the place where we can even receive it. And we're saying, God, I don't even see how that could happen. I don't even see how I could own my own company. I don't even see how I could ever actually make that kind of money. And the Lord said, but you're going to get it anyhow. The Lord, I don't even think it's the truth. And God said, but you're going to get it anyhow. Amen. The Lord, I don't even see how I can get healed. Nobody's ever been healed of this. And God said, but you're going to get healed anyhow. Amen. I'm going to take a step here and I'm going to authorize some things that's going to go over and above anything that you can comprehend. You're going to get it anyway. And you know what? Bless God, it wasn't a holy conception either. Amen. God got a hold of her little unbelieving husband and somehow another day produced a child. Amen. It happened. The Bible said, according nine months later, amen, she had a baby boy. My God, what a day that was. Amen, she lived nine months, amen, remembering that there was a day she said, what well, don't happen. And God said, for nine months, I'm going to remind you that I prophesied truth. I wonder if there's something that could be stirred even now in the Holy Ghost. In the minds and the hearts of some people right now. And the Holy Ghost is saying, I'm fixing to prophesy to you. I'm going to tell you something that's fixing to happen in your world and you don't even believe it. But I'm going to bring it about and I'm going to prove to you that I'm God. And I'm going to prove to you sometimes I do things because you need it. Not because you believe it, but because you need it. Well, now that, that touched me right there. I said sometimes God's going to give me things and do things not because I believe it, but because I need it. Brother God. Because I need it. God said I'm going to do it anyhow. But God, you don't know what you're working with. Uh, my God, I'm weak. I don't have faith. I don't have the ability. You said it takes faith, and God says most of the time it does. Uh, but there's sometimes I just overstep that particular principle, and I do things not because you know you need it, but because I know you need it. Uh, and I'm going to do it anyhow. Hallelujah to God. Thank the Lord. Praise God. The Bible said a child was born. Grew up. Became a young man working in the field, doing the duties of a young young man in the field, working alongside his father. 
The Bible said one day he had a headache. I have to believe he probably had a stroke of some kind, a heat stroke. Even the scripture says that the father spoke to one of the servants and said, take this boy back to his mother. And he took that little fellow back to his mother and the Bible said she took that child, that thing that God had promised her, that thing that God had put in her life, but she held on to it all day until noon and finally breathed its last breath. I'm inclined to believe she prayed all day long, holding that baby in her arms. So that young man in her arms, holding on to that young man and praying that God would heal him, that God would save him. But she heard his last breath. And when she heard that last breath, her mind probably went back to the time when she looked that prophet in the face and he said, God's going to bless you with a child. And she said, don't mess with me. Don't lie to me. Don't give me something and then take it back. I want to know, is it mine? Does it really belong to me? And now she's sitting in a chair walking that young man and he breathes his last breath. But the Bible said she had built a room. She had built a room. She had a place. I like to call it the sanctuary. Amen. I'm going to tell you, the sanctuary church should not just be a place where we receive blessings. Church should be a place where we do the things, amen, the work of God. Amen. It's a place sometimes where we're challenged. It's a place sometimes where trials hit us in the face. It's a place sometimes where everything's not going good. But it's also the place where the blessing begins. And I'm going to tell you, it begin there once. It can begin there twice. Hallelujah. And the Bible said she took that promise and she laid it upon the bed of the man of God and she shut the door and said, I'm going to go find the one that preached this thing into my life. I've got to hear him preach some more. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, folks, faith come up by preaching and preaching by the word of God. Every now and then you've got to go back and have a promise preached back into your spirit and preached back into your heart. Amen. That's where it starts. And that's how it continues. Every now and then you just need some old fashioned preaching. You need somebody to get up and open up that like that book and tell you that God is real. God is still alive. God is still here. God is still asleep. God is still on the throne. God is still the same. Best for me to pay it forever. Every now and then you just gotta go back to the same place and let the Holy Ghost just preach it into your heart again. She shut the door. Amen. And she said, I'm going to go find him. Bible tells me that her husband, obviously he was not as impressed with what God had done. For he said, you don't need to go looking for the man of God. It's not a holy day. It's not Sunday. He said, it's not a special time of worship. He said, wait, wait until another time. Amen. I'm going to take any time's a good time when you've got an emergency. Any time's a good time when you've got an emergency. If you've got a spiritual emergency, I'm here to tell you my God's office is open. Amen. It's open at 12 o'clock at night. It's open at 3 in the morning. Now, I've had some of recent contact me in the wee hours of the morning and say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I'm going through a sickness. I'm suffering in body. I need God to move. Uh, I'm going to tell you the same God I feel here behind this pulpit. Bless God. It's the same God I feel at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I get on my knees and I start talking to God. Uh, and I find out His office is still open. Uh, oh, hallelujah. He's not a God that just shows up uh, at special times. Uh, he's a God that shows up when there's an easy time. Uh, when there's an emergency. Uh, he's still the same today and forever can you say praise the Lord she said I'm going to find him amen I'm going to have church somewhere amen if I can't have church in that room I built amen if I'm going to go up there and just lay death on the bed I'm going to close the door behind me. I'm going to go find the man of God. Uh, and we're going to have church. Uh, amen. I'm going to tell you, folks, you don't need a chandelier. You don't need carpet. You don't need pews. Uh, when there's a spiritual emergency in your life, uh, you go find the voice of God. Uh, it may be the reading out of these pages. Uh, it may be an old message on Facebook. Uh, it may be an old tape or an old CD. Uh, but plug it in, turn it on. Uh, and say, God, I've got to have some church. I've got to have some church. Oh, hallelujah, God. You know what's going to change this generation? It's not more entertainment. No, my friend, it's going to be the voice of God. It's going to be somebody opening up that book and preaching the word. That's where our joy begins. And that's what keeps our joy living inside of us. 
Amen. Go to find that man of God. She gets on that mule and she starts riding. She told that servant, don't you slow down unless I tell you to. In other words, what she said was put the pedal to the mouth. We're going to church. I would to God that they get a hunger on the hearts of men and women in these days of COVID uh, that some of them lead men would get so hungry while they're getting over this disease. Uh, they're going to say in their spirit, bless God, when the last of these symptoms are gone, uh, I'm going to put the pedal to the metal. Uh, amen. I'm going to get to the house of God. Uh, I'm going to get to an altar. Uh, I'm going to get to a place of prayer. Uh, hey, folks, don't crack your feet into the house of God. Not if you're hungry. When I'm hungry, I don't need to be called twice to the table. Huh? All I need to hear somebody say it's ready. Oh, hallelujah. God, it's ready. I'm here to tell you heaven's been cooking up some good stuff for the last four or five months. And heaven's about ready to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you and I cannot contain. I'm here to tell you God's got to come back. I see God's got to come back. God's got a response. Hallelujah. get to the sanctuary. Somebody said, what is the sanctuary? Well, it's not necessarily a line chandelier, amen, carpeted pews, amen, floors. That's not the sanctuary. The Bible said for two or three. Amen. That's what she was doing. She said, the husband won't get with me. He don't believe what I believe in. She said, I'm going to leave his unbelieving self home. <laughs> I think I'm not hit on something right there. <laughs> she said, I'm believing I'm believing somebody in the house. Amen. She said, Come on, servant, you get with me. Amen. That makes two of us. And if we can find the man of God, that makes three of us. And the Bible said, For two or three are gathered together in my name. He said, There I am. He didn't say I'm coming. He said, I am there. You get two or three people together talking about Jesus. Hey, you don't need to pray now. You don't need to beg him to show up. According to the word of God, the book says he's already there. When you walk in this church and there's more than two people here, or there's at least two, I tell you, he's already here. He's already walking around saying, I want to touch somebody. I want to bless somebody. I want to heal somebody. We don't need to go somewhere to lay and say, oh, God, come down. No, he said you just get two folks together. He said, I'm already there. She said, if I can get in the sanctuary. So she rode her little old mule right on in there with that servant. And here they come across the plain. And the Bible said, the man of God looks out of the mountain. Now here's something. Get a hold of this. Get a hold of this. The man of God did not even know why she was coming. I'm going to tell you, sometimes God leaves the preacher in the dark. He doesn't even know what he's preaching. Amen. He's preaching to folks he doesn't even know he's preaching to. He looked out across the plain and he said, well, here comes that, looks like that shooting light on it. And he said, her servant, they're on that mule, looks like they're in a big hurry. He said, the Hazel, run on out there and catch them about halfway before they get here and ask them three questions. He said, I want you to ask her, amen, how is it with your husband? I knew he was a devil when I was there. <laughs> He's probably causing her all kinds of trouble. Doesn't like the fact that God gave her a son. Amen. Go, go ask if that's the problem. Amen. And then he said, after you ask her if that's the problem, ask how things are with her. It's either going to be the husband or it's going to be her. He said, I'm sure it's not the child. But go ahead and ask. The Bible said, the Hazel went out there and said, how is it with your husband? She said, it's well. Well, you know it wasn't all well. He was a devil. Any man that would send his dying son home and not even go check on him, there's something wrong with that man. That's why right, something wrong with that man. Amen. But you know what she said? It's all right. He's well. Amen. Then she said, Well, how's everything with you? She said, I'm good to it is well. He said, Well, that is on one way. She said, Well, it's well. He said, Well, what in the world are you doing here? Amen. What she was saying was, I know right now my husband's not good. He's a devil. But I can already see him full of the Holy Ghost. I can already see him acting as an usher. 
I can already see him working at the church. I can already see him dancing around the front of the church full of the Spirit of God. And she said, I'm riding this mule today because of what I believe God's going to do. I'm riding this mule because I believe in what God's going to do. I'm riding it hard. I'm riding it fast because I'm believing what God's going to do. You know why I come to the church with zeal? Why I'm still preaching the Word of God through the middle of all this COVID? It's because I believe in what God's going to do. I'm not dragging my feet. I'm not dragging my spirit. I'm not talking negativity. I'm telling you that God is still the same today as He always was. He's still filling people with the Spirit. He's still healing sick bodies. He's still delivering people from sin. And I'm here today riding that mule. And I'm riding it hard. And I'm riding it fast. Because all is well. Amen. Amen. So how is it with you? I'm sure the devil crawled up on her shoulder and said, Now look, lady, you're going to have to tell the truth. You know that boy's back home and he's dead. But I tell you, once you get on a roll in faith, man, oh man, it's exciting sometimes to see a church just go crazy on faith. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I think it's good for us to get over into that reckless faith. Yeah, yeah that reckless faith. That reckless faith is like going out in the middle of 5,000 people looking and realizing there's not anything out there for anybody to eat and walking back with five loaves of good fish and say, God, I've got something. We've got to take care of now. I've got five loaves and two fishes. We can feed these 5,000 people. <clears throat> oh, and one man popped up and said, man, that ain't going to work even if everybody got just a tiny bit. You take that five loaves and two fishes and break it down into 5,000 little tiny bits, I mean, that ain't even going to be a taste. <laughs> Amen. But when you've got reckless faith and you're standing in the presence of God, you don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. You just know it's going to happen. If you just get it in the hands of God, everything's going to be all right. When you get to the sanctuary, you got one plan. That is, whatever your need is, I'm going to get it in the hands of God before I leave here. I'm going to put my children in the hands of God before I leave here. I'm going to put my family in the hands of God before I leave here. I'm going to put my future in the hands of God before I leave here. Because once it gets in the hands of God, it's going to be all right. God's going to take care of it. It's not something you can put on paper. It's not something you can take a calculator and figure it out. No, friend, you just have to put it in God's hands. And God is always enough. I said God is always enough. Let's give him some praise. He's always When I look at the word of the Lord, I find a lot of folks that would be in places of blessing. And when they get in places of blessing, God would do a great thing. They'd want to build an altar and give God glory. But when I was studying this, the Lord sort of quickened in my spirit. Sometimes we need to build a tabernacle right in the middle of the battlefield. I said, we need to build a tabernacle in the battlefield. I was reading the book of the 23rd Psalms, and the Bible said there that David spoke under the anointing. He said, he sat at the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Amen. We always talk about giving God glory and praising Him and worshiping Him in a place of blessing. Amen. But I think many times we've walked away from places of contest and challenge. Amen. When we needed to leave a marker and let the devil know he had been in a fight. Let the devil know we're still standing our ground. Amen. David said when I was in the valley of the shadow of death, he said he prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And he said he not only fed me, but he said he turned around and anointed me in the presence of my enemies. There's nothing that provokes the devil and angers him anymore than to see God lay his anointed hand upon you right in the middle of your test, right in the middle of your valley, right in the middle of your challenge to watch you worship God and magnify. My God, right in the middle of your valley. Oh, hallelujah. That's something that just angers the devil. I'm here to tell you, my God is not just a fair weather God. My God is not just a sunny day God. He's not just a God that shows up when the birds are singing and the suns are shining and the flowers are blooming. My friend in the valley of the shadow of death, he shows up. When the stench of death is in the air, and when life is hanging on by a thread, and when it looks like people are running up the white flag, and they're about ready to quit, that's where God steps in. And God says, right here, we're going to have church. I remember 
remember walking into Good Shepherd Hospital a few years ago with my brother back here, his wife that had a stroke, several strokes, several many strokes. Uh, even the nurse came out and basically told everybody, right now she just hanging by a slim thread. Uh, there's a good chance she won't make it. Uh, amen. And I watched those kids. Uh, amen. They stood in the halls of that hospital and they got a hold of a nurse's hand and the nurse got a hold of their hand and that black nurse raised their hands and said in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, let's believe for healing in your mother's body. Uh, oh my God. It wasn't long until they walked back out uh, and they said something's happened. Uh, she's going to get through this. Uh, it's going to oh my God. God, it's going to be okay. Yeah. I'm going to tell you if I can just get to where the voice of God is. If I can just get in the presence of God. I may be in a valley. I may be facing a test. But we're going to have church right here. I said we're going to have church right here. I said we're going to have, I said we're going to have a move of the Holy Ghost right here in the valley of the shadow of death. You see, the presence of God is always in the sanctuary. And the sanctuary is not always a building. The sanctuary is where two or three are gathered together. Where anybody steps together and comes together in one mind and one spirit and says, It may look dark, but God is here. It may look hopeless, but God is here. Who would want to serve a God? That only shows up in church. Right. Who would want to live for a God that only shows up in church? Amen. I'm going to tell you there's been many times uh, when you got up in the morning and you didn't have enough faith even to say a hallelujah. And all of a sudden God looked down uh, and he said, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm fixing to operate uh, in a realm where there is no faith in your life. Uh, and I'm going to reach out there and lay my hand on your little children. I'm going to get them to school and back. I'm going to protect them. You haven't prayed. You haven't worshipped. Your drives are gone. But God steps in and said, I'm still going to be God. Hey man, I'm not a robot. You don't throw switches. You don't push buttons. I'm a God with a sovereign will. And sometimes I do things simply because I'm God. I walk into your world and I do things that you don't even know you need. I keep my hand upon your family. I put my hand upon your children. I keep your jobs going. I keep your breath breathing. I keep your heart beating. I'm still taking care of you. You must realize I'm always the God that's on the scene. One of my favorite places in the life is after Jesus had been crucified and buried in a tomb. The Bible said after the third day he arose. And it said the eighth day being the first day of the week. Amen. With the doors being shut. And it was referring to the disciples that were in hiding because they were afraid they were going to be crucified just like Jesus. And Brother Billy, they went and all congregated in a house shut the windows and locked the doors. And the Bible tells me the eighth day being the first day of the week, then came Jesus, the doors being shut. And the Bible said Jesus passed right through the wall of the house. And he looked those disciples in the face. Amen. He did not show up because they had great faith. He did not show up because they had been in a long prayer meeting and asking for God's help. No, my friend, they were talking about going back to fishing and tax collecting and whatever they had been doing before they found Jesus. They were all talking about living and going back to the past. Amen, but that didn't stop Jesus. Amen, they locked their doors, they shut their windows as if to say, Amen, we're on our own. We don't know where Jesus is. As far as we know, he was crucified and buried. And we don't know what's going to come of all of this. But when they put the padlock on the door, the grave burst open. And the Bible said, then came Jesus. The door being shut. I'm preaching to somebody here today. Somewhere in your walk with God, you gave up. Somewhere in your walk with God, you ran up the white flag. And you said, I just don't see how anything can change. I've done my best. I've given my best. I've tried. 
everything. You don't have one ounce of faith to get your feet off the ground if the trumpet sounds. But I'm here to preach to you there's a God that when you lock your doors and lock your windows, sometimes He just comes walking in. Not because you prayed to live with the God, but because He loved you enough that even when you did not know what you needed, He came because He was God. He just came walking in. When your door was shut. When you were ready to quit. When you were ready to throw in the towel. My God, there's been times in my life and years gone by when I was going through very challenging moments. And amen, I wasn't praying like I need to pray. I done wore myself out. I feel like I've done my very best physically, mentally, and spiritually. Amen. It wasn't because I was just a good person. But I remember one time I sat down at a dinner table after working that day all day long. And I was tired and I was discouraged. Amen. I hadn't prayed, Brother God. But I sat down at that bar, amen, at that kitchen. And I started to thank God for my food. And all of a sudden, Brother Jerry, it was like... I felt something as strong as any camp meeting I've ever said it. I felt something as strong as any conference I've ever been in. Amen. Then came Jesus. I want to tell you, friends, you're not on your own. You're not by yourself. Amen. When you give up in your spirit and give up in your flesh, there's a God that says, but I have quit. You may have quit, but I have quit. You may have given up, but I haven't given up. I'm still God. And I can go behind those doors, and I can go behind locked windows, and I'll find you where you are, and I'll come in when you least expect it, and I'll just say, peace, be still, be not afraid, it is all.
when everything falls into place. All the singers are there. All the musicians are there. Sometimes you're going to have those unexpected moments when something's going to come through the side door. <clears throat> Knock you off your pedestal. You're going to be like the man in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. When the Bible said there was a man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem represents the house of God. Jericho represents the world. And he was on his way down to Jericho. And the Bible said he fell among thieves and they stripped him. The Bible said they left him half dead. There were different people that passed by. There was a priest, there was a Levite. You know the story. None of those stopped. But then there was a Samaritan. And the Bible said when he saw this man left half dead between Jerusalem and Jericho, it said he came where he was. I'm so glad he came to me. I'm so glad he came to me. I think a song, amen, I think Brother Price may have sung it. But it said, when I could not get to him, he came to me. He came to me. I couldn't reach up and touch him, so he reached down and touched me. <laughs> he came to where he was. Thank God for one that comes to where we are. It's not a long distance relationship. It's not someone that just gives us a casual wave and says, y'all be careful you hear. No, he's the God that comes to where we are. When you find yourself in the midst of a spiritual battle, you don't need to look out there somewhere and say, oh, I wish I could go out there where God is. No, my friend, God's coming to where you are. If you're sitting in a hospital room somewhere and your little loved one, your baby, your child is on the other side, of a surgery wall somewhere under the chapel in the hands of the doctor and you're sitting somewhere outside and I see you praying. I'm going to tell you, he comes to where you are. He's not going to wait until you get back to church on Sunday. He's not going to wait until you get back and hear the choir sing. He's going to come to where you are. Jacob fell asleep there. 
And it was declared the next morning that this is Bethel. This is the house of God. You've gone as far as you can go and you can't go any further. And God said, I'll meet you there. When you've gone as far as you can go and you can't go any further, God said, hey, we're not going to build a tombstone. We're going to build a sanctuary. Amen. We're not going to call this a tombstone. Take your rock, lay it down, put your head on it. But tomorrow, this is not going to be a tombstone. This is going to be called Bethel, the house of God. When you've gone as far as you can go and you can't go any further, God said you can call this uh, the end of it all. But I'm going to call it a place of worship. Uh, I'm going to call it a place of ministry. Uh, when you get to the end of your road, uh, instead of tying a knot and saying it's over, you need to realize this is only a pause. Uh, even if God's going to build something wonderful here, He'll come into your valley, He'll come into your problem, He'll come into your trouble, and He'll build a sanctuary. I said He'll build a sanctuary. There's going to be some praise come out of that place. Uh, and somebody said, Praise the Lord. Jordan is pulling over his face. And you don't know how you're going to cross to the other side. God said in the middle of this, I'm going to build a sanctuary. The Bible says as soon as the high priest's feet touched the waters of Jordan, when Israel crossed over to the land of promise, it said Jordan dried up. And in the middle of that river, the Bible said the high priest declared that 12 stones for an altar would be built. As a memorial, as a memorial, in the middle of the place that said you can't get across, God says, I'm going to build a memorial to victory. Yeah. <laughs> yes. In the middle of whatever it is that's in your life that says you're not going to cross from point A to point B, I'm going to stand in your way. And God comes in and says, no, no, no. I'm going to build a memorial right there that will testify to generations that in your most desperate times, I moved in and I made a way where there was no way. And forevermore there will be an altar that will say, in your worst times, I'm still God. In your most difficult times, I'm still God. In your weakest times, I'm still God. When you think you're about ready to quit, I'm still God. The Bible said, young men shall think. But it said, the name of the Lord, our God, he shall never faint. Young men shall grow weary and faint. But the name of our Lord shall never grow weary. And our God will never faint. Aren't you glad for a God that's always there? A God that always delivers. A God that comes in the most difficult times and makes a way where the sin of the being Hallelujah. I come to a close this morning again with my remarks to challenge every one of us. I think we need to dedicate a place of worship in the midst of this COVID virus. Amen. How often do you get to build a church in the middle of a virus? How many opportunities in your life are you going to have to have revival in the middle of COVID? Hope to God probably won't ever happen again. But while it's here, let it be recorded in heaven and earth. <laughs> we had church. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Sometimes we had an outside. Sometimes we had an inside. Sometimes we had it in the car. Sometimes we had it in the living room. But we had church. If we could just get the word of God and the praise of God going, we were going to have church. Let it go down in the annals of history that the abundant life church in Blakewater during the COVID virus of 2020 still had church. Hallelujah, still had church. Amen. When people were locking their doors and closing windows, Jesus was still walking in. I said, Jesus, oh, hallelujah. I said, Jesus was still moving. Jesus was still ministering. Jesus was still healing. Let's stand and give our Lord and God a hand of praise, shall we? Let's give Him some worship in this house, hallelujah. If Satan chooses to attack and try to steal our promise that God has placed in our world, 
I'm here to tell you, if we can just listen to his voice yes. again. Yes. Hear the voice of God. Yes. And hear to the preaching of the word. Get back to the sanctuary of worship. Where we built our first consecration. And received our first promise. If we'll just go back there again. That's where it started at first. And that my friend. Is where it starts. Again. We just go back and do it all over again. Go back pray again. Go back worship again. Go back preach again. Go back sing again. Mm. My, 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 my. Live stream is okay. <clears throat> Thank God for it. But I don't get live stream a lot of what I get up here with you folks. Something about getting together with God's people. You'll do it again.